Yeah, so uh, how many of you uh, ever shop with Big Basket? Uh, very nice, very nice. And uh, how many of you continue to shop with Big Basket? Uh, quite a few have tried, but many have dropped out. And I would love to catch up with you separately to understand what caused that and, and probably use that to do some analysis. But, uh, you know, I work for Big Basket, as you now know. and uh, I'm, But my journey started very differently because um, I actually was a customer of Big Basket before I became an employee of Big Basket. Uh, I enjoyed the services. I enjoyed uh, how well organized the organization was in terms of customer focus. And I said I'd love to be part of an organization like this and see if I could add value and make a difference. Right? And that's how my journey started. So I say, I say that uh, because I quickly wanted to you know, tell you about my background uh, uh, and just move on uh, to what the focus for today is. So by way of background, uh, engineering degree and an MBA and then another master's because I figured at some stage in my life I was running out of tricks when it came to advising clients, right? And so that, that's what got me started uh, and I said I, I should you know, retool myself and, um, and got another master's focused on supply chain and analytics. Um, and in terms of work life, uh, spent a lot of my uh, time in uh, career uh, as a consultant advising companies uh, predominantly manufacturing supply chain that then became analytics and uh, and then I began to realize that it was time to take my own medicine and so I joined the industry and that's since then from the time I you know, joined Dell I've been very focused on analytics as part of an internal function and not as a consultant right and so uh, I set that context because I wanted to you know talk about a couple of things number one is that a wise man once when he was asked to give a speech uh, walked up to the stage and looked at the audience and asked them, uh, do you have a sense of what I'm going to cover today? And the audience, being respectful, said, yes, we do. And he said, then I have nothing much to do and walk away. Right? And so <laughs> the, uh, the, speak, the audience understood what was happening and therefore they invited him back. And he came back and he said, uh, and he posed the same question. He said, uh, do you have a sense of what I'm going to speak today? And they said, no, we don't. Because they learned from the first time, right? And they said, no, we don't. And so the guys, the vice man said, then there's no point in talking about it today and walk away again, right? And so the audience then uh, figured out that, you know, the man is up to some tricks and went and brought him back again. And, um, and this time the vice man's question was the same. He said, do you have a sense of what I'm going to cover today? So half the audience said yes and half the audience said no. And he said, the audience that knows what it is can talk to the audience that doesn't know what it is and walk away. And the reason I say that is because after what uh, Hindol covered today, I am tempted to post that question back to you because my topic is going to be you know, fairly following what he had just covered, right? So do you have a sense of what I'm going to cover today? Some answers, please. I'm not walking away, I guarantee that. Okay? So, uh, so the reason is I'm going to just follow up on what uh, Indol covered today and uh, spend more time talking about um, this laptop. This ah, sorry. I, for some reason, thought that's the. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so the question um, that I'm going to try working with you is to help you understand uh, how do you make a career switch into data science. And I think that was the lead-in that uh, the lady in the back sort of provided. And I was jumping in the back, you know, hoping that Hindu would not answer that and allow me some space to come and uh, cover something. Because if we had answered that, then that's the presentation that I wanted to do today. So, but unfortunately for me, he as a nice uh, and a good speaker was, you know, uh, helping uh, the lady in the back with some answers. But nevertheless, I'll try being a little different and cover that today. And that's the second fact that I wanted to cover. Well, Hindul comes from a consulting services perspective as a third party partner that offers analytics. I work as part of an organization driving analytics within the organization. And so when we look at hiring professionals into the analytics team within the organization, we keep certain things in mind. And that's the perspective that I'll try bringing today in helping you understand how do you make a career switch into data science. Before I go further with that question, let's take this example, um, which is you have a full-time career, you are an IT professional, you are maybe an engineer, you are an accountant, whatever that may be, but you love cooking, 
you watched enough of these shows, the master chefs and whatnot, then you figured out that, wow, this looks fun, this looks nice, and I'd love to do this for a career. Right? And more importantly, you want to do this at a large scale. You want to, you want to offer catering services for large events. How do you go about doing that? Because you are you are an IT professional or an accountant or whatever that may be, but you love cooking and you want to take this up as a life, as a profession. You want to switch careers now. Exactly the kind of question that is probably running in your head when it comes to data science. So I'm looking for some help here to see if we could use that example to build some blocks and some blocks that could then help answer the question that we have in front of us now. So, if you want to make that career switch to offering catering services at large scale, how would you go about doing that? Uh, could I get some help from uh, the members of the audience? How do you plan that? Would you walk up to someone yeah. who's planning a big wedding and tell them, never done catering, just watch TV shows, I want to cater for your event. I study some of the existing uh, person who are in this market and analyze how I can by Very good, that's the first step. You will speak to someone that's already in the profession who is successful and understand from him what are things that are needed to be successful. Fair point, very good. What next? So you've learned that and so now we are going to walk to the same gentleman who's running this big event and tell him, I spoke to this expert, he told me everything, I now know what it takes to cater. Would you allow me to cater to him? We have to understand the customer, what does he want? What is okay. But even before you speak to the customer, would you do some more work? Yes. Yeah, you, you start small, you probably go for your family members and then you see how the response is and then you Very nice. Uh, so the answer from the back is that you don't start big because you don't know what it takes to serve a big event. So you stall, start small. But even before you start small, would you do something else? Uh, yeah, to upskill yourself. Upskill yourself. Important. Yeah. Very important, right? Because when you love cooking, when you watched TV shows about cooking, would that allow you to go to the kitchen and make something? No. So you need to understand the many elements of catering into an event, which includes understanding how to make food, particularly food for some large events, understand how to pull a bunch of people together and get them to execute an event, and also understand the mechanics of running this. because. You could, you could, you know, skill, upskill yourself to do, to learn how to do cooking for a large event. You could pull a team together. But if you don't manage your costs and you are running, you know, out of money by doing event after event without being profitable, at some stage, you've got to begin to think about shutting down, right? And therefore, it's also important that you understand all the elements of running a catering business, right? And so, like someone said here, you will upskill yourself. You will learn what are skills that are needed to be successful, right? That then, then we go to the next step, which is what the other gentleman pointed out, which is, with all this, you now know cooking, you have a team, but would you still walk up to that gentleman and tell him that I've never done an event of this scale, but would you let me do this? No. So what would you do? You would find guinea pigs, right? You would probably start small. Start with your own home event, right? Try doing there. And then go to friends and relatives and try some events by catering to those events. And through that, what are you doing? What are you doing with those experiences? Credibility. Building credibility, right? You're sort of building credibility for yourself for you in two parts, by figuring out whether this is what you want to do for a living, and also learning by saying, that I can scale from doing for 20 people to 50 people to 100 people. And through that, you're building a portfolio of work. And a portfolio of work that then allows you to take this to a potential customer and make the case to them to say, I know what it takes. I have built the skills to do that. And I've done it at varying scales as close to what it takes to deliver for this event. And then make the pitch for this, right? And that's exactly what happens when you want to make a career switch to data science. When you want to make a career switch to data science, and hopefully forums such as this, interacting with professionals as well as others that you know, would allow you to meet those experts and understand from them what it takes to succeed in a career in data science. 
And then the next step after that is having understood the factors that are required for success or the skills that are required to be successful, you're going to build those skills as part of your professional skills. And then start small, build a portfolio of achievements or success that makes you a compelling candidate when it comes to a large organization that is looking to hire for data science. That's exactly what my presentation is going to cover, but I'll go to some level of detail just to make this a little more specific. Right? <clears throat> so, when we talk about this catering example, you you know the person wanted to make that career switch and therefore had to be sure that he was making the career switch. And, and for that, the key question that I would like each of you to answer, who is interested in making the career switch, is why do you want to make that career switch? Okay. And that's why I've broken down this presentation to say why, how, and what. Because being very, very clear about why in everything that you do in life gets you the clarity that you need to do to execute the next steps. If you've come across this um, wonderful uh, video by the uh, right? And it helps people uh, think through decisions that they need to make in life. Understand the purpose of things that they do in life. And according to him, and rightly so, he points out that the toughest question for most people to answer about what they want to do or what they do is not what they do. Meaning, if I walk up to you and ask you what do you do in life, it would be very easy for you to answer what you do in life. Right? Somebody asks me, I'd say, yes, I do analytics. Even harder is to do, how do I do that? And even that is possible to answer by thinking through, by saying that I work with business teams, I understand their requirements, and I solve their problems using analytics. But the harder and the toughest question to answer is, why do I do what I do? And if you find the answer to that, then the rest of the well, answers follow automatically. Right? And that's why I pose this question to the candidates that I meet with, as well as you know, I'm posing this to you, to see if you can answer this for yourself. So the, for the lady in the back who asked the question about how do I make a career switch into data science, my first response is going to be, can you answer why do you want to do that? Do you want to do that? Because the nature of the work excites you, that you love to build models, you love to use models and answer questions. Is that what it is? Is that the salary? Because the news everywhere is that data science is a fantastically paying job. And so you, you're looking at it and you're wondering, is this something that I should do to double my income, triple my income? Is that the reason? Or is it the, the top job title? It says data scientist. Right? It looks fancy. I mean, you know, space scientist, data scientist. Scientist just adds a bit of you know, glamour right, to the whole uh, proposition. So is that what drives you to make that switch? Or is it the coolness, the company that you work for, the industry that you belong to? You could walk around saying, I'm a data scientist. I am doing data science for so and so. Is that what it is? And I'm not saying, I'm not judging any of these, right? Because all of these are cool. I mean, why does someone want to be an actor? It's a combination of all of this. It's cool, it's, it's you know, well-paying, and you get a lot of publicity, fame, and so on. And so there are reasons why people do, you know, different things. Is it because you're tired of your current job? and you're stuck in, stuck in a rut and you want to figure out a way out of it, then data science seems to be the natural progression, right? Or is it that you're not sure? It sounds interesting, but you still don't know why. And so, figure out why it is. And the, and the reason why I say that is because unless it's, it could be any one of these reasons, but if, unless it's driven by the passion to make a difference in the field of data science, it's going to be very, very hard because you've got to wake up and do this after the first 10 days when the excitement fades away as a matter of routine, day after day after day, right? And so from outside, the movie industry looks very glamorous, it looks fantastic, right? But when you get in, the excitement fades away in the 10 days and you realize that you've got to tumble down, you've got to take beating, you've got to face the audience and take trash if the film flops and so on and so that will happen. In the data science job, you build your first model, you put it out to the business teams and just like Hindul pointed out, you will get criticism right on your face to say that the model is absurd. And you should be able to pick up your ego, walk away from that and still say I want to do this job the next day. Right? 
you know, therefore, it's got to come from the passion to say, I want to do this for a living and I enjoy doing this for a living and everything else in the path to this is something that I can overcome, right? And so, that's the first thing to be sure of. Why do you want to make this change and are you making this change with what it takes to achieve the change, right? The second important thing that I want to set as expectation up front is for someone that's, that's planning to make that change, it clearly is an 18 to 24 month journey. It's a year and a half to two year journey. Right? Even for someone that wants to exclude all of these family actors, right? Actors coming from a family dynasty. But for anyone else that's planning to make that switch, it is a multi-month journey. You need to upskill yourself, you need to do some of these small things, plays and small movies and YouTube videos before you hit the professional circuit, right? And therefore, do not make the assumption, and I'm saying this so that I set the right expectations, that you decide today, in three months time you could move into the profession, right? It's partly because the industry is maturing. There are a variety of professionals that are available who come in with some of the experience needed up here, you know, up front. And so for the, someone that's making this change consciously from a very different industry, even if it is an IT professional, you've got to put in the network to make that happen. And so make sure that you have, you are making every one of this minute that you're going to spend in the next 18, 24 months pay for itself by building a very compelling portfolio of achievements over the next 18, 24 months, right? So, this is the key message that I want to spend before we move further to talking about the next step. Understand why, make sure that you will have the passion to do this and invest the next 18, 24 months in doing all the things that we just talked about in the case of a professional caterer, right? Any questions before we move forward? So switching to a career in data science and this is the what of it. What will you do? What is data science? And it's a fairly broadly used term today. It covers a gamut of things. And it's important to be very clear about what in data science would you want to do. And it varies based on the organization that you will work for. The term data science today refers to pretty much everything here and more, right? A data engineer, a data analyst, a data scientist, a data architect, a data researcher, any one of this is data science. And so be sure about what you want to do and they are not all the same jobs. The one big difference is if you work for a small startup or an upcoming organization, you may end up doing a little bit of all of this. If you like it or not, you will end up doing that because the organization is la not large enough to have a 50 member data science team with 5 people doing data engineering and 5 people building models and 5 people building the data architecture and so on. So it's you know, inevitably three or four people. So when, you know, when the analytics team at Big Basket started, it was one person. Two years later, in 2015, when I joined, it was four people. And amongst the four of us, we had to do everything. Right? And so when you grow, when you become large, and if you go to a Facebook, if you go to a Google, or if you go to any of the large ones in India, as well, a Flipkart or whatever, then you now begin to see a structure, and these are very different roles, and therefore, the role definition would clearly tell you what that role is about. Now there are pros and cons to both of this. So if you want to be a data engineer and you end up joining a small startup, it's likely that maybe 15-20% of your time is going to be data engineering. Everything else will consume your time. And if that doesn't drive you, motivate you, and if you want to spend 100% of your time doing data engineering, you will not enjoy that. But if you're someone that wants to understand the spectrum of work that happens in data science, and don't mind doing a little bit of everything for a period of time before you understand what motivates you, drives you, then a startup is a fantastic case. On the other hand, if you're someone that is very clear about what you exactly want to do in data science, then a large entity is fabulous. Where they'll have a very structured role and a clear job definition. But if that gets boring, then you'll be attending the next event that says, how do I change streams within data science? Right? And so, that's the downside of getting into a very structured role. Right? And so, have, you know, make sure you understand what is it that you want to do. And I'm also going to debunk some of the myths that exist about data science itself, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on that. So, who's a data engineer? Right? And, and I'm not saying these are universally, generally, commonly defined terms. This is 
this is some of the terms that I've seen being used and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about each of these. A data engineer is someone that is working with data at its rawest level, right? who's working on picking unstructured data, data that is sitting in files, sitting in locations, storage locations, and is transforming the data into a model or into a framework that is usable by the rest of the organization. So he's focusing on re-engineering the data, structuring the data for better analysis. And it's a fascinating job, it's an interesting job because there's a variety of data, how do you, you know, structure the data to make it better. A data analyst is someone that then works on that transformed data and is answering some very basic questions. It could be reports, it could be charts, it could be answering the questions on why is this data telling me what it is telling me, why is sales down? Why are my customers not shopping as, as often as they should be? And so they'll, a whole lot of it is just the why. And your end deliverable is not going to be a model, it will be a presentation, it will be an email, it will be a chart. Not to say that it's bad, it is, in fact, in my organization, we make sure that people do that for a you know, bit of time, so that they can build a strong foundation on understanding what are those components of the data. Right? A data scientist, on the other hand, is someone that's building models, like Hindol was pointing out, right? A recommendation system, a collaborative filtering model, or a, or a logistic regression model, or whatever the case may be. So he's, well, he's understood the data well, he understands the business well, and is answering questions that are future-looking. What can I do? How can I improve? It's not why, what happened in the past, but it's more about what happened in the future. A data architect is someone that is structuring databases, structuring large data stores. You know, people that work with Hive, Hadoop, Spark, and so on are people that are building these large data storage systems and are architecting it so that data can flow in, it can be analyzed, and it can be used, right? It's like, you know, very different from what a data engineer would do. Data engineer is working on point solutions, the data architect is architecting future storage systems, right? A data researcher, is sort of what happens in um, you know large organizations that have dedicated teams doing research work, building models or coming up with algorithms that may not have immediate implementation but have a horizon of two to five years when it comes to implementation. And that sort of differentiates what happens with the data scientist and a researcher, right? A data scientist is building models that need to show return on investment right now, right? In the next three months, six months. Whereas the researcher is working on future looking models that probably will evolve over a period of time, will have ROI in two years, five years time frame. Right? And so if you are research oriented, make sure that you're joining the right team in the right organization. Right? So you can't walk into a startup today which is looking to use analytics to grow sales, grow customers, and say I want to do research. Now can you walk into the R&D team of a large organization which is focused on data science and say I want to do models will be productized and implemented right away. And so, understand the difference and make sure that you pick the right uh, role and the right organization, right? Also, what it takes to make the switch is to understand the cost of the switch. There is, you know, in some cases there's a look back, right? You could walk back after you've made the choice, but in most cases you may not have that option. Once you move forward, you cross the Rubicon. You can't walk back and go back to your organization and say, my apologies, I thought I'll try this, it didn't work out, can you take me back? Because the organization has moved on. And it'll take you three, six months to figure out that it's not working. And so be very conscious of the cost of making that switch. And what are those elements? Some of those elements are these, right? Number one, you may have a very good title now. You may be a vice president, a senior vice president. And when you walk into a startup to do data science, they're not going to make you vice president in data science, right? Uh, so you probably are going to start at lower levels. So are you comfortable with making that switch? The business card is going to say very different things, right? So to some people it matters and rightly so, right? I mean, you've been to 10, 15 years to build a career, to earn some things in life, and you're going to walk away from that, and are you okay with that? Right? Number two, the career path. And career paths in two ways, because you've spent 10 years in your current organization, there's a clear path defined for you, because the organization has invested in you, you've invested in the organization, so you know the way forward for you. And you move to another organization, you, in a different stream, you don't know if you're going to be a success. And if you were a success too, you don't know how the organization is going to evolve and how your role is going to evolve. 
right? And in some of these cases, to be honest, in the data science profession, particularly within the industry, the career path is still evolving because it's, you know, the last five years is where it's picked up steam in the startup industry and and everyone's growing because the industry is growing, but 10 years from now, what would be the career path is something that's still in formative stages. And so are you comfortable with that uncertainty, right? The salary. 10 years of career, in, in, you know, time invested in a current career is probably giving you a compensation that may not come with starting up front. And if you go back to that example of, you know, switching from an IT profession to a catering professional, 10 years of life as an IT professional has brought you certain salary levels. And if you're going to go make your first catering event, they're not going to pay you the same thing that you were earning when you were an IT professional. So are you comfortable with that? Is your lifestyle suited to making that change? Right? And lastly, visibility. Going back to you know, the visibility that you enjoy in your current organization because of the time invested, it's going to be very different from the visibility that you'll enjoy in the new role in the new organization. And so, would you be okay being lost in the crowd for a bit of time before you shine? And do you want to handle that by setting milestones for yourself to say that this is a career switch, I'm starting small, I'm going to learn, and more importantly, I'm going to report to people that are much younger to me. And my VP here knew me, here the VP of data science wouldn't even know my name, and I'm okay with it for the next two years until I can shine through. Right, and so ponder that and make the choice to say, yes, I understand what it takes and I'm going to, I'm going to make that investment because all of that is investment. And if you have the right attitude and the passion, it will pay off, but you'll have to make that choice instead. And also, and this is very, very important and something that Hindul talked about and, you know, he and I have never spoken before. Uh, I saw him for the first time though I've heard of him and he used the same word that I used here and that's absolutely the truth. Data science is not, you know, all cool. It's grunt work. So the models that we build, if you go to the Big Basket app, you'll see a variety of things that are powered by analytics, right? Uh, all of the user behavior and understanding the user behavior and making the app work better. What is called clickstream data is collected, mined and analyzed by the analytics team. There's a shopping assistant on the, on the app called Smart Basket which uses your behavior and computes your sh uh, shopping basket. That's powered by analytics. If you go to some of the perishables and look at whether they're in stock, out of stock, forecasting for those and making them available is powered by analytics. Right? The recommendations that you see in your smart basket or elsewhere are all powered by analytics. The offers that you see are powered by analytics. But all of that is the outcome from a lot of grunt work. Each of this takes many iterations to get to the point where it's on the app and you're measuring the success of it. But what it takes to get there is a lot of wrangling with data to to look at data to you know slice it and understand what is it that the data is telling you building a hypothesis based on that and using that to build it a good example is what we are doing with our recommendation engine we found out that the earlier recommendation engine was not so impactful so we went through tons of data it took a long time to build a model that would process it for a large number of customers so you could get a great match and iterate and deliver it and it gives you a marginal improvement over the model, whole model, right? The previous model. And now we've got to look back and say, was it worth it? But it is, it makes a it makes an improvement. Now the next question is how do we make it even more impactful? Right? It breaks my heart every time I speak to someone that uses the Smart Basket app and tells me one of two things. Never seen the Smart Basket, I don't know what it is, or never seen the recommendations, never bought recommendations. Right? All of this is done to help customers have a great experience. But it means that you know, there is work for us to do, a lot more work for us to do. And so, all of that is grunt work. So the models, it's not about AI, it's not just about ML, it's not about self-driving cars. Right? I mean, people walk faster than self-driving cars. I mean, even if you put them on the road, right? So, <clears throat> so be conscious of the fact that there's going to be a lot of grunt work. Just like when it comes to catering. You watch catering, it looks like a fabulously planned, executed event, but somebody's cleaning the kitchen towels inside. Somebody's wiping all the dirt off the floor. And a lot of work goes in before what is put out is enjoyed by the others. And therefore, be prepared for that. Right? If you thought it was cool, it's going to be nice, you're going to be, you know, in a space vehicle going to Mars, it is not what it is. It is a lot of the hard work that goes in to, you know, bring the output out. And I, I don't want to make it a very depressing Saturday because I started with saying why and what and so on. That's not the intent. 
I enjoy the job. I, you know, I, I've been doing this for the last eight years. I enjoy it, and uh, I enjoy it because I love solving problems. I love using data to solve problems. In fact, what I get fun out of is when people tell me, "I've never seen Smart Basket. I've never used recommendations." And it's you know a lot of the Big Basket uh, internal employees themselves are customers of Big Basket. And when I get that feedback, I actually pull data for them and tell them that you've actually used recommendations. You you know you you bought products. You use the smart basket and so on and so, and that you know using data constantly and breaking notions, breaking stereotypes, and building the next generation of products that will excite our customers is what gives me a lot of fun and that uh, makes it exciting. Therefore, it's a very exciting field. If you're very data oriented, if you're very logical, if you want to you know build solutions that ex you know enhance the customer experience, whoever may be the customer, B two C, B two B, it doesn't matter. Then this is the field for you. But I, all I'm saying is, you know, set your expectations right and come in, and you'll certainly then find it worthwhile, right? And then I'll get to the very last part, which is, how do you make this change? Which is the question that you probably are waiting to hear from, because the depressing part is all done now, right? The why and the what. This is like the doctor telling you, this is going to, you know, cure your illness, uh, but here are things you need to know. You can't eat after this for 15 days and all of that, right? So all the bad part is there, so now the good part is going to come in. But before I go to the very last slide, any questions? Yeah. So, uh, do you have to build any self-driving car for a trade-off in terms of data science work? Like, in the, uh, where do you see it being applied to the, the, the part from, like, maybe, recommendation, uh, recommendation? So, the power of data science, eventually, is in personal education, right? <coughs> so, what's the difference between going to a big basket and to a local big bazaar or a Kerala store? At Big Basket, we recognize you, right? And if you don't mind, can I take your name? Uh, it's Jayasurya. Jayasurya, yeah. So when Jayasurya comes to Big Basket, I know it's Jayasurya. I know he loves bananas. I know he loves oranges. And therefore, I personalize everything for him. I tell him, you know, oranges are back in season. You bought it last year. You've not bought it yet. And the best oranges are in town. Why don't you buy it? I, I can send you an email, an SMS, and so on. It's personalization that makes it powerful, and and you could get to the nth level of personalization, right? And customers are delighted because they don't want to be treated as one in the crowd, but as JSUV as an individual, right? And so, with that being the objective, and with you know data giving you the power to personalize anything that you can do with data to personalize is what the data science field is going to do for the near future, right? And self-driving cars, and you know. Uh, finding uh, image scanning to understand what are symptoms of cancer and early detection of cancer and all of that are the manifestation of that personalization, right? Because if you walk into a hospital that doesn't use data and treats you as just one more patient who has a you know a specific illness, then they are not personalizing things for you. Data science will make that happen. It will look at you and look at your symptoms and look at million other symptoms and in no time be able to distinguish your symptoms and tell you this is what it is and therefore make it personalized that way for you. And that's what data science is going to help you. So, one more question. Uh, so, regarding this personalization, so you are basically building a recommendation. So, uh, can you just brief us on, uh, give us a brief synopsis of what are the algorithms we use for building this uh, smart, smart box? And uh, in terms of recommendation engines, uh, any apps like, for example, I've heard Spotify as one of the best recommendation engines. And uh, from a from a user behavior, I read a tweet recently where a user was saying, if Spotify was a man, mm -hmm. I would have mm -hmm. not read it. <laughs> yeah, that's how well they know me personally. Right? They create that playlist. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and what breakthroughs do you see uh, in terms of algorithms that that are going to come in the next five years or ten years that that will. Uh, Increase this personalization or recommendation engine algorithms by far Sure. So, uh, I think it will have that, you know, answer a part of that question, and I'll go back to the answer when I cover this. But that's why I said, you know, I should have followed him. He's done the job for me. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I'll try answering your question. So, when it comes to recommendations and personalized recommendations for you, we use a variety of algorithms depending on what the need is. When it comes to offers, we look at what you've bought and what you've not bought and therefore give you offers on those items that, are, that you're likely to buy, right? When it comes to recommendations in the shopping assistant, for example, that's based on looking at your basket and looking at baskets of other users like you and finding what are things that others like you are buying that you've not bought and recommend that. So, sort of, you know, all of this is propensity to buy, picking the propensity to buy and uh, use that. 
and shopping assistant is, is not built on anyone else's basket, just your basket and your buying behavior and understanding that and uh, doing that. Now going back to your question about Spotify, and you know Netflix is another great example. I know people that tell me today that the Netflix recommended queue is all they rely on and don't even pick anything on their own. If Netflix recommends, please watch this next, they just go with that, they don't, right? And like you said, it's, it's possible someday that there's going to be a AI, you know, man or AI woman that people will be happy to marry because it understands them very well. Truly personalized, never gets angry at them, right? Uh, so, uh, and uh, soothing and comforting and all of that. So that's quite possible. But coming back to how our recommendations going to evolve, which is a topic for a different discussion, but in the sake of, you know, uh, uh, continuation of this topic and quickly to close out, it goes back to personalization, right? And so what I mean by that is today I'm personalizing your shopping assistant, the smart basket, or your recommendation, using whatever data that I have about you. But there's a lot more data that is that exists about you that resides outside of my data systems. And how is Spotify cracking it, how is Netflix cracking it, is by aggregating all of the data and understanding a lot more about you than what their own data tells them about you. For example, I am recommending to you based on the fact that you bought a certain type of bread, a certain type of butter. But if I figured out that when I showed that banner on the app and you never clicked it, and I used that different product. Or if, for example, I can find out that while on the road you looked at a particular ad and you made a note of that in your mind and I can bring that into my recommendation engine, I can make it even more personal, right? I Let's say in 10 years or 20 years down the line, I have a digital profile of myself which has my, uh, which, ha which exactly knows what I want. And do you see in the big picture, like my digital profile being on a blockchain and then different companies being able to access my profile to have an extremely personalized, like a her kind of a experience? Yes. So we are now getting into the minority report territory, right? Uh, if you've seen that uh, movie, then that's what we're talking about. And so, I, I'm, I'm not going to paint a very rosy picture or a bleak picture because in all of this, the important thing to keep in mind is there's a trade-off between personalization and privacy. The more you're willing to share, the more personalized things will become, but you're also handing over your data to someone to make that happen, right? And so, that balance, that question... That's why I said blockchain. Do you think blockchain can help mitigate? The question is, at some point, your data is being looked at by people that you are, you don't know who is looking at, therefore you will still have the question. It's not going to go away. We are not solving this privacy problem, you know, with any other solution until there is a conscious legal ethical process to do that, right? The technologies will be blockchain, whatever that may be, but the questions will still remain. And so the answer is that it's, it's you know, what you would want, the recommendation systems will build it for you with a highly personalized nature depending on how much you are willing to take that, right? Today, a lot of folks are very comfortable with having any of these voice assistants at home, Alexa, Google Home, or whatever that may be. But keep in mind that to understand what you're saying, they also have to understand what else is being said. They are not saying, oh, now that uh, you know Jay Surya is speaking, I need to listen to him. If listening to Jay Surya's friend and mother and others speak, and it's then uh, recognizing Jay Surya's voice. And so some people are comfortable with it, some people aren't. And so that's the choice that is going to eventually drive what uh, data science can do for you. Right? So, uh, how has it changed over the years and where do you see it in like next 10 years? Yes sir, so uh, you make me sound very old when you say I've been in the industry for a long time, so uh, uh, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, but uh, to your question, how has it changed in the last many years? I think the word that uh, Hindu used is the right word to describe. There's a lot more focus on ROI, right? When, I, when we set up data science teams or analytics teams, in the first five years, ten years, it was cool to have, you could talk about it to your fellow CEOs and others to say I have an analytics team and so on. But now the questions are, what is the other one? We built a recommendation system, how much is it improving sales, right? And how much did it cost us to build that? So the industry is maturing. The questions are not about what you're doing, but how is it benefiting the customers or what is the return on investment, right? And where will it head in ten years? I'm not someone that loves to predict, uh, even though that's my job, uh, day in, day out, because like someone said, all predictions are wrong. Uh, but nevertheless, what I would try telling you is that it's, it's, it will become um, a lot more structured uh, in the sense that um, there will be very specific uh, career paths, very specific you know, goals and responsibilities and outcomes, 
and uh, and the industry will also you know space out into what is academia, what is research, what is industrial applications, and uh, and it become a very organized uh, place, right? Not to say that it's it's not uh, organized at all, but all I'm saying is it's getting to become more and more structured. Career paths, roles will get defined, and so on. Now, if you talk about how the industry will organize itself in the ten years, that's my answer. But if your question is on what analytics can do and data science can do, I talked about it. It will get more focused on personalization and making, you know, impact from a very personalized perspective, right? Okay. So, the more interesting part about uh, how do you make that uh, career change, right? And so. Again, as I told you, I've never met Hindu before, but um, and so don't uh, elect me if I'm repeating some of the things that he said. But you know, that's a sign of the fact that that's how the industry is looking at uh, data science, right? So you will need to know all of these. You will certainly need to know math. You will certainly need to know statistics. You will certainly need to know programming, machine learning, and more importantly, being able to work with very large data sets, right? And very importantly, business. Data science done in a vacuum without the business context is not going to be impactful at all. It will it'll be a failure and therefore understanding the business context in which you are solving the problem is very, very critical. Right? And I'm always along with uh, you know, uh, like-minded professionals and are making that progression. In the absence of that, you'll be on your own timeline and you'll look back and realize that it's 12 months since you made the decision and you're still where you are. Whereas this program would force you to stick to a schedule and get something out of it. Right? Therefore, make the choice if you're someone very disciplined, can set a time schedule for yourself, can make progress on that, fabulous. Don't pay a cent extra, use MOOCs, get it done. But if you think that you need a cohort, someone to motivate you, someone, you know, a group that will keep a schedule for you and allow you to achieve that, then invest in that. And then you'll certainly make progress. Right? And lastly, like we talked about in the catering example, and again, going back to what Hindu said, the, how do you, now that you've learned some things, you know how to build a recommended system, you know how to apply regression in a classification problem, right, or in a regression problem, right, and you, you can you can use better model to predict if a customer would churn or not. Very good. All of these are lab work, theoretical models, school projects, right? How do you then take that out and apply in real world? Apply that in your own jobs. I, it would be hard to believe that any of you is in a job today that requires no application of data. Right? And if that's the case, then you seriously should consider moving out of that into a data science job. But in the absence of that, there is you know, some work in your area that requires application of data, some structured techniques. That's a great place to apply. If you're forecasting what your sales is going to be next month and you're using an Excel sheet, you've now learned you know, Arima or a time series model that you can build an R or Python and deliver it and can have better accuracy, absolutely. Apply that right there. And why is that necessary? For two things. One, lab work, school project around what they are, right? They are done in a very isolated vacuum environment without real world application. And when you apply them, that's when the rubber hits the road. And therefore, you would now realize the problems with data quality. And you will realize that the model building is 20% of the whole effort, 80% is just getting the data in the right shape, understanding the data and making predictions, right? And so it helps you understand the reality. Number two, it makes a good case in your portfolio when you're talking to the prospective employer to say, I did this, and here's the impact I delivered from applying what I learned. And that's why, find opportunities in your own area for three, six months and try applying them there. Number two, we've all heard of Kaggle, there is you know, Machine Hack, these are all forums that throw interesting problems at you, real world problems disguised with, you know, used with disguised data, throw your knowledge at those problems and see if you can uh, demonstrate that you can apply the knowledge and come out with outcomes that are meaningful. So don't take them lightly, great opportunities, use them, right? Anywhere that you have hackathons, Kaggle, Machine Hack, participate in them and use the opportunity to challenge yourself and deliver outcomes from what you've learned. And lastly, if you are not full-time employed, then you have a great opportunity. Consider an internship. And we do that heavily. Anyone that approaches us, who is between jobs, who is finishing school, I mean graduate school, and wants to make a career to data science, what we do is, when you, when you have experience in data science, then it becomes a very easy choice to make. Because your portfolio is fixed, and I can use that to dig deeper and understand if you have the right fit. But if you don't, and you are someone that wants to make a switch, what we do is, Tell them to come on board for two months internship. And through that, two things happen. One, they find out going through the rigor that pulling data is a large part of the job and understanding data is a large part of the job, and they figure out if that's what they want to do. And it also tells us whether they have what it takes to succeed in as to be a part of the team. Because for us, what matters is ownership, attention to detail, proactiveness, all the soft elements over and beyond what hard skills you can bring. And therefore it works well for us. And so do not hesitate. 
to take up an internship opportunity, two months, three months, six months, the longer the better, right? And that adds to the portfolio. So all of these are things that I'm recommending that you do to add to your portfolio. So when you, so you've done this in the 18, 24 months, right? You've done a structured program, you've uh, done some moves, you've understood them, you've applied that in Kaggle, Machine Hack, whatever the hackathon is. You've done it with your work, and now look at your resume, 18 months down the road, it's going to look impressive. You understand the fundamentals, you've got the practical application also in the portfolio in terms of where you applied the results. And then you walk up to an employer to talk to them, along with internships, etc. You now are a very compelling candidate. It's much like what you talked about when it comes to catering. You upskilled yourself, you built small parties, you built a credibility, and you're now walking to an employer, you know, a prospective employee saying, I want to cater for the next big event. They will have no doubts in hiring me. And so that's the part to getting it done. Network, use forums like this, keep talking to people to find out you know, what uh, is available there, uh, how you could work with them, learn from them and so on. And in some of these is where you learn of someone that has got an internship position open, wants someone to come in and whatever the, you know, the option may be. But again, very last important thing, be pragmatic. Recognize that you may have to start low but aim high. You may have to start by writing models or coding or writing SQL statements to pull data. That may be your first you know, 15 days, 30 days, 6 months of the work. But if your eventual goal is to build these fantastic models that will make a difference, you will get there. But you be prepared to start uh, low and uh, continue to aim high. Right? So that's the uh, you know, last set of uh, thoughts that I wanted to share with you. So essentially to summarize, as I said, understand why, make sure you have the passion. Understand what it takes to do that, which is you know the skills that you need to build, and uh, recognizing the reality that data science is not just ML AI models, right? And once you have that foundation, then work on the house, which is to build the capabilities in these skills, do MOOCs, do structured programs, apply this in your work, take internships, participate in these competitions, and through that build a compelling portfolio that makes you an attractive candidate for someone that's looking to hire data science professionals. Okay.